This episode addresses hard topics like eating disorders, sex, and mental health disorders, so it may not be suitable for young listeners or people on the path toward healing. Hey, everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. All right. So right now we are in a series called For the Love of the Elephant in the Room. We decided as a podcast team that at the start of the year, let's tackle hard conversations. Let's just kick it off like this. What are things that are difficult to discuss that are confusing, um, maybe subjects that we don't know enough about or that we're uncomfortable with, right? Um, And rather than continue to avoid them forever, what if we just face them head on? And so we put this whole series together of topics that in some ways are easier to ignore but really do warrant our attention and our investment. And so um, we just wanted to bring topics to the forefront that are usually kept in the shadows. And I just knew that we could not have a complete series to give to this community without talking about mental health and wellness, like running the gamut, like mental health, all of its ancillary, like, threads, suicide ideation, like the whole, the whole package. So I don't know about y'all, but growing up in my world, we just did not talk about this. We didn't mental health. Wasn't even a thing I ever heard. I never even heard that phrase. Like if someone was struggling, we just assumed they were having a bad day, right. Or like a bad month. Um, we didn't even have the terminology to see if, someone might be suffering truly from something greater than just like the blues um, or a rough patch. Um, I think those are probably all the things we would have said back then. Now, fortunately, the world is tuning in here in a much bigger way. I mean, piles have now been written and studied and discussed um, to bring that sort of mental darkness um, out of the dark, right? Because depression is real. Obviously it's clinically diagnosable. Anxiety is real. Um, Suicidal ideation is real. Um, And I know a little about a little something about all this firsthand. And I'm, I bet uh, most of you do too. Um, Because our mental health, if not attended to will eventually affect our physical health because our bodies are wired to give us these alarm bells, right? When something's out of whack. And if you're like me at all for so long, you just, um, ignore it. Right. Or push through, assume you're just going to push through. You'll feel better later. Um, so I'm just really grateful. We're not left to our own devices to figure this out anymore. And that we're not alone. Um, this mental health is literally affects every human person. So this requires the same level of attention and care as any physical ailment we experience. And so if this is something that makes you uncomfortable or scared, or even ashamed, we are here to tell you it is okay um, to talk about it. It is okay to reach out. It's okay to admit something is wrong. It is okay to seek help. Um, you know that I did. I um, I shoved my own anxiety down for so long that I ended up in the ER with like catastrophic blood pressure where my doctor, <laughs> you guys, like I'm literally sitting on the table in the doctor's office, my heart pounding out of my chest, my blood pressure at like 165 over like 120. So I'm like, absolutely astronomical number tears just like flowing, like out of my eyes, running down my face. And right that second, I'm looking at my doctor and I'm saying to him things like, it's just, I'm okay. I need you to know that like, I'm strong. And this isn't, I don't know what is happening, but I am actually really strong. All evidence to the contrary. (laughs) And so my doctor, bless him. Like here's this girl who's literally falling apart physically, um, trying to convince her own self and me that she's fine. You know, and he put his like 
sweet little hand on my shoulder. And he was like, um, you're, you've experienced trauma and your body has just taken you as far as it can go. And now this is your body saying, please, like you need to stop and get help. And so that was when I first, well, first of all, tackled my blood pressure issue, but then that's when I went on, um, an antidepressant and my doctor prescribed me an anti-anxiety medication for when I was like spiking and like, and then I was in counseling. And so this, this matrix of factors like pulled me up from the bottom of the ocean and set my feet on a solid path again until for me, uh, my mental health was strong again. And so that's what we're talking about today. We have an incredible, um, elephant confronter, if you will, um, with our guest today. And he's spent most of his adult life walking his community and organization through mental health Um, concerns, naming them by name. Um, And and he'll talk about this, but his initiation to this world was when a friend was deeply struggling, like with uh, just running the gamut of mental health crises. And he kind of saw the lack of resources for her and wondered if there was just another avenue for people to feel not just safe and heard, but to access the help that they need and get the intervention that they need when they need it. So this led him to creating a mental health and suicide prevention organization that's changed so many people's lives. I mean, I, I can't even imagine how many, um, he'll probably never know, but his organization is called to write love on her arms. We'll talk about that, um, name and what it means. And, um, so I'm really happy. I'm so thrilled to welcome my friend, Jamie Torkowski to the show today. And, um, so Jamie, let me tell you about him. If you don't already know, he is a New York times bestselling author of, if you feel too much, his book, which we'll discuss here in a second. Um, and then after founding to write love, um, he reached and he found that in his twenties, by the way. So it's 15, 16 years old at this point, but, um, he was, he reached like millions of people and provided guidance and help and like lifelines to people struggling with depression and suicidal thoughts. So Jamie's also a two-time TEDx speaker. He's traveled the world speaking at universities and concerts and conferences and events. And he's been interviewed by Rolling Stone and NBC nightly news and my personal favorite, as you know, CBS Sunday morning, to me, that's the pinnacle. I mean, if you are in CBS Sunday morning, you've arrived, that's it. Just hang it up. Um, and so Jamie's works impacted like a whole generation of people and his compassion is really extraordinary. And his understanding of this after so many years in the field, is really like deep and important. And I'm just really thankful to know him. He's a new friend. And uh, we talk about later in the episode, but, um, we connected last year cause we were both sad. <laughs> so it was a great way to like make a new friend anyway. Um, I'm so thankful to know him. I'm so glad he's in my life and super thrilled to support everything he does. And so this is a great conversation and, uh, I hope that you hear something today that encourages you or helps you feel seen, um, or gives you maybe even the next one or two steps forward. Um, cause it's kind of packed in here of like good counsel and good direction. And I think you're going to love it. So I am super glad to share this great conversation with my friend, Jamie Trukowski. Hi, welcome Hi. to the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, apparently one of the deal, what part of being like a friend of mine is that then you have to like come on my podcast. So I'm, I didn't tell you that up front, but now I'm you know, <laughs> I'm honored to be here. Okay. I've already told my people a little bit about you. Just like I talked briefly about to write love, but can you go back and talk about where and why, like you started with this and how long you sort of built and ran that organization and kind of where you are now. Yeah. 
So To Write Love on Our Arms started in 2006 as an attempt to tell a story and more importantly, an attempt to help one person who was a brand new friend at the time, my friend Renee Yoey. And I was renting a room from a friend in Orlando and he was very much a big brother, a source of wisdom for her. He was in recovery. And when I met her, she was struggling with all the issues that the organization speaks to today. So depression, addiction, a history of self-injury. There had been suicide attempts in her life. Um, today, you could expand that to uh, anxiety, eating disorders, ultimately the question of what do we do with our pain? What do we do mm -hmm. with grief, failure, regret, all of these different things? Um, can we talk about it? How do we talk about it? Can I get help? What does that look like? But back then, it, it was just a story that I wrote and posted on MySpace. Because Whoa, 2006. nice. Yeah. And really, the story took on a life of its own, started selling T-shirts as a way to help pay for Renee's treatment. And mm -hmm. the T-shirts very much took on a life of their own as well. Started to hear from people in other states, then mm -hmm. other countries, people asking how to get involved, how to help a loved one, people who had lost friends or family members to suicide or to an overdose people wanting to learn, people wanting to join the conversation, you know, asking to volunteer. So my life changed pretty quickly. It was a pretty unbelievable beginning, especially for what became a nonprofit. And I led that, did that for 15 years and then mm -hmm. officially stepped away uh, about six or seven months ago. So we announced mm -hmm. it in July. And for me, it was just, I think it was just time for change. There was the desire to be more independent. I've always been I think more of an introvert and not a great manager. I didn't have dreams of being a CEO. I didn't really enjoy, not only didn't enjoy that side of it, but didn't feel like a great fit for it. And the organization's in a great place. They're really thriving. I believe in them. I cheer for them. It's mm -hmm. literally some of my favorite people, my sister, my mom, my yeah. childhood best friend are all full-time. So they continue to help people. And I'm thankful that I was able to step away, but really believe in not only their present, but their future, you know, to continue to really save lives and connect people to help that can change lives. And for me, I want to keep writing and speaking, keep talking about mental health and what it looks like to be human, what it looks like to care about people. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in a season of transition. It's pretty um, awesome that you built something with such lasting power. Cause you were what, were you 25? I was 26. Yeah. Yeah. That it is, I had no mental health experience, no nonprofit yeah. experience. Right. You're just like a guy working like in with the a, surfing industry. All I had was a surfboard, <laughs> <laughs> a different one back then, but I know it's, uh, it's awesome what you've built. Um, and 15 years later, that's kind of, that's rare air to have that kind of longevity. And then it's just grown and expanded so very much. And of course, like your feedback, I'm sure from people at this point is just, could you ever quantify how many people have told you what to write love has meant to them or to their brother or to their daughter or whatever? No, it, it, that, that never gets old, you know, and whether that's a, a comment or a tweet or an email or, you know, every now and then a, a conversation with a stranger, you know, at a coffee shop or in an airport, uh, whether it's, you know, these things are personal for so many people, for most of us in some way, at some point, whether, you know, whether it is someone who has lost someone, whether it's someone who's simply concerned about someone they care about. Uh, but, you know, the best thing, I can't imagine anything more gratifying than, hey, this thing that you started saved my life, or I ended yeah. up getting help. I ended up seeing a counselor or stepping into treatment because of your organization. And, you know, we, we see people with tattoos, like the logo tattooed on their shoulder. And I've always, I joke, but it's true. It's like, that's a good reminder not to screw the whole thing up. Like that's a good reminder <laughs> of, of what's at stake and how much this means to people. It's totally been an honor. And I couldn't even have dreamed up something like what the last 15 years have been. Yeah. So like foundationally, I guess probably all of us know somebody in our midst, if it isn't our own selves, who has struggled with depression or any number of mental health um, conditions. But I think a lot of us, or maybe even most of us, um, 
kind of coming up to this point didn't have the language. We didn't have the education. We just maybe even the like community around the conversation um, to discern if somebody that we love, or maybe it's ourselves has something different than just the blues. Mm -hmm. Right. Or like, you're just like down or this is situational and it's going to pass. Um, and so before you started to write love, like what is your, what was your personal history here? Was it none like with friends or yourself that you can look back on and kind of go, Oh, now I see with clearer eyes, what was going on. It was close to none. I, I usually say my first experience with depression was really my first romantic relationship. So my first girlfriend, I was 22 and she struggled with depression. And I grew up in church, grew up in the church. And looking back, I had no tools to help her. I just thought mm-hmm. if, if we pray for you and we talk to you, you'll be okay. But I'd had, mm-hmm. I knew nothing about mental health. I knew nothing about what she was actually living with and dealing with. And, you know, felt like I made mistakes in trying to care for this person who I did genuinely care for, but I, I didn't know how to do that well. And I also think like, even when I met Renee, you know, I, that was also in a church community setting. And I think a lot, even maybe within our community at the time, you know, some people said, oh, that's, that's really sad. I'll, I'll be thinking about you guys, or I'll be praying for you guys. Mm-hmm. And, I think for me, it was just this attempt to show up, like even quite simply, literally, physically, you know, so much of there's sort of this infamous five days that I spent with her that that my friends and I spent together. They ended up making a movie largely about the five days before once she was denied entry into treatment and then five days later admitted. And so it was like a lot of basic needs. It was keeping her safe. It was keeping her fed, trying to keep her laughing and smiling and we had a deal at the time that for every day she stayed sober, I would smoke a cigarette, which she just <laughs> thought was hilarious because like I had never smoked before. So I was really bad at it. But it, I didn't know that. it was just like, all right, we got to just, you know, and I, I remember I stayed up late five nights in a row, just getting to know this person and, and mm. getting to know her story. And then David, my friend was in recovery. And, and so he was really the voice of wisdom. I, mm. some people, because of how it's all gone, have tried to kind of position me as the hero, but I was yeah. really more of a fly on the wall trying to be a friend and, and trying to listen and then and then eventually writing about it. But very limited tools, very limited language. And, you know, 15 plus years later, it is amazing to see that I think wherever you look, whether it's, you know, Hollywood or sports or music, more, more and more people are talking about these things, you know? Um, yeah, totally. Like, I want to talk about that because really just in the span of the origin of to write love to now everything around mental health has changed the it, i think a lot of the stigma is removed we understand more than we did then i i think now sort of in the common discussion is the understanding of how many factors um impact mental health like social isolation and economic status like what's your racial profile i mean there's so much um, that goes into it. It's not just, you're just like a defective person or whatever we used to say. Sure, sure. Um, and so I, I'm curious what you've learned, like over the last 15 years, what do you, what do you credit this to? What, what do you, what are you looking at from the, from the inside and saying, these are some changes that we've made culturally, um, that have really helped us get out in front of mental health kind of in a new way. Yeah. I think, I think honesty is contagious. You could say that about vulnerability. I think that as people have started to talk more openly, it gives other people permission to do the same. And, you know, whether those are celebrities or leaders Mm -hmm. or, you know, Olympic superstars, it seems like everywhere we look, people are giving us permission to talk about our mental health you know, this person struggles with depression or anxiety, you know, this person checked into treatment for an addiction. Like we realize other people are living in these places and other people are having similar experiences. And I I think it, it just hopefully reinforces this idea that not only can I talk about this, but I can get help for this. Mm -hmm. And so I I think there's been a lot of progress in that regard. Mm -hmm. 
I forgot to make you tell the story because it's a good one about why and how it is that you named the organization. Because first of all, it's a mouthful. Mm. So you did pick something that's hard to say and hard to remember. So good job Mm. on that. Um, And so, but the story behind the naming of the organization is pretty cool. Would you tell it? Yeah. So the night I met Renee, after I met her, essentially we were trying to get her to come with us and, and to step into treatment, to, to enter treatment. And she essentially told us that she needed one more night that my friend David could pick her up in the morning and, and take her to treatment. And that night she ended up, you know, she had a history of self injury and she Mm -hmm. later that night we had, we had driven away and she was with other people and she ended up taking a razor blade to her forearm and wrote the word fuck up, which is obviously very shocking, very jarring, extremely sad. And I I've told this story in churches and schools and places where they've asked me not to say that word. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important um, because I don't think it's really about profanity. I think it's about identity. And I think that's, that represents what she believed to be true about her life and, and how much regret she lived with, how much of a failure she felt like the shame, the sadness. And so, you know, a few days later, sitting down to write about getting to know this person, it, I came back to that word that she had really believed on her body and wondering if we could replace that. If over time she could believe that she was loved and deserving of love. and and we had stayed up talking about these things. Like is sobriety possible? Is healing Mm -hmm. possible? Is, is life worth living? And so that's what was wrapped up in this unusual phrase was, was really this idea of, of believing something better for our friend and hoping she could hold on to that. And obviously today it's, it's a goal on a much bigger scale. Mm -hmm. And it is funny though, because if you were setting out to start a charity, you probably wouldn't name it that you wouldn't expect that to be well received. And, but I think part of what was really cool was it forced people or it invited people to figure it out. Like, mm-hmm. what is this? And, and the joke, especially early on, was a lot of people thought it was a band because it, it <laughs> looks like the name of a band. And we had the yeah. support of other bands. And, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, I mean, literally, we would sometimes get comments where it's like, hey, I really like your band. Yeah. It's like, well, you should um, <laughs> maybe take a deeper dive. <laughs> Does it still surprise you like how um, much attention and support to write love got has received like over 15 years and like by whom it's the reach is pretty far. It's, it's yeah. gotta be further than you thought it would be. The support has been unreal, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I, I think it feels important to point out like there's been celebrity support, you know, Joaquin and Jessica Chastain and yeah. Alex Morgan. There's been all these big, exciting names and people who have been wonderful, but there's been even more individuals who are not right. household names. You right. know, it's like a high school student, a college student, someone doing a bake sale or a benefit show, you know, someone just sharing it on Tumblr or Facebook mm-hmm. or MySpace back in the day and people using whatever influence they have, people, people simply communicating, talking about this thing that, that struck a chord with them. And and so it's always felt important to point out, like, we all have some kind of influence, you know, we all are connected to other people. There are some people who listen to us. Maybe it's your roommate, maybe it's a handful of friends, it's coworkers, obviously celebrities have a different amount of influence, but it, you know, going back to the very beginning, I think we just got to see the best of the internet, the best of Mm, people. Like when mm-hmm. people are moved by something and believe and want to respond and participate, we, we just got to see that. Talking about money can sometimes feel like another elephant in the room, right? Certain things are just uncomfortable or not seen as acceptable, but sometimes we've got to get real about our finances. One thing that is controversial exactly zero times out of a hundred is saying yes to a better checking account. And here's what it is. Chime. If you haven't heard of it, It's an award-winning app and debit card that has no overdraft fees, no foreign transaction fees, no monthly fees, and no service fees. What they do have is over 60,000 fee-free in-network ATMs at many locations like most Walgreens, 7-Eleven, CVS, where you can access your money when you need it, where you need it. You can also send money to anyone, even if they aren't on Chime. And it's 
fee free for you and no cash out fees for them. For me, this part has been so convenient for friends, family, my team, because who in the actual world has the right amount of cash on hand when you need it, right? So make your first good decision of the new year and join over 10 million people using Chime. Sign up takes two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at chime.com slash for the love. That's chime.com slash for the love. Banking services provided by and debt card issued by the Bancorp Bank or Stride Bank NA. Members FDIC. Get fee-free transactions at any MoneyPass ATM in a 7-Eleven location and at any AllPoint or Visa Plus Alliance ATM. Otherwise, out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. Sometimes pay anyone instant transfers can be delayed. The recipient must use a valid debit card or be a Chime member to claim funds. All right, darlings. We are coming up on Valentine's Day, a holiday which you might actually love, but it's also quite possible you feel lukewarm or less about this day. Instead, may I offer us the opportunity to honor the day by loving ourselves. One way I found I can treat my body with the respect she deserves is by clothing her in comfy things that are well-fitting and make her feel good. This is why I am such a fan of this brand, Third Love, you know, I, you know that I wear third love bras almost every single day um, because I discovered that not all bras have to feel uncomfortable, turns out, or make you want to fling them across the room as soon as you can. Um, but what I also love about third love is they have the fancier lingerie, too, that looks as good as it fits and feels. Their latest deco lace collection is designed to make you feel sexy 365 days a year. Putting on this incredible collection feels like indulging yourself every day. And it's the perfect way to celebrate Valentine's Day. Uh, one more tip. I highly recommend that you check out Third Love's Ultra Soft Loungewear because I kid you not, it's, it's literally like wearing a hug. Um, Third Love obsesses over each and every stitch of every bra, underwear, activewear set, and beyond. So you never have to think about how something feels or looks or wears. They have 100,000 five-star reviews, and those don't lie. A feeling is believing, I, I promise. So upgrade to everyday pieces that love your body as much as you do. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order at thirdlove.com slash for the love. So that's 20% off at thirdlove.com slash for the love. What kind of... Um resources or tools? What are the layers of to, to write love for people at this point, having developed now over a decade yeah. plus? So my favorite thing, and this is in the last couple of years, but we have a find help tool. I still say we, uh, I'll always be the founder mm -hmm. and I, I, I'll always believe in it, but there's a find help tool that I continue to point people to almost every day. So in the past, we would we had resources available by city and basically mm -hmm. by major cities within the U.S. But logically, people live in other places. People live in towns and rural areas. And so in the last couple of years, they've added a find help tool where people can click this button, enter their zip code, and then narrow down the search by specific issues or topics. And so essentially anyone in the United States, whether it's for them or for a friend in another place, can come and within a few minutes, get a, a head start, get a list mm -hmm. of resources, whether it's counseling, support groups, treatment centers, crisis hotlines. So I think that's something that, that I really love. And, mm -hmm. and then within that, I think the specific resource I probably point to the most, especially with young people is crisis text line, mm -hmm. where anyone in the US can send a text to 741-741 and almost instantly get a response from a trained crisis counselor. So whether it's three in the morning, three in the afternoon, if someone is really struggling, feeling overwhelmed, you know, feeling confused, you can hear from someone who has the tools and the language to meet you in that place. And then I, so I love to point to both of those. And, and there's also an email, find help at twaloha.com. Mm -hmm. So find help at the To Write Love on Our Arms website, where if, if someone needs help finding help, we have someone who can, can do that. That's awesome. That's so good. That's one of the most overwhelming pieces when you're in trouble is I don't know where to start. I don't know who to call. I don't know what the hell, I don't know what helps out there. And so having a centralized place to send people is just monumentally helpful. I want to pivot because the reason that this whole organization started in the first place was because you wrote about it because you are a writer. Um, and 
So I want to talk about your book because you wrote a book. If you feel too much, it's very, it's, you've nailed the title for yourself. Um, thoughts on things found and lost and hope for, and it was incredible. You know, I've read it and you actually read, you really read I did. It. No, I read it. I read I it all. I read it cover to cover and you know, it's so good. You know how I felt about it and you're just a really, really great writer. And so I like to see that over the arc of your career, you sort of steered back into the possibility of being a career writer, which you should be. So can you talk about why it felt important to you um, to write this? What is it about? Um, how have people responded to it? How did you find the writing process? Um, cause this first one was a bit more of a compilation. So for you, mm-hmm. some of it was like pulling. Yeah. Um, and so I want to talk about that project and then what you want to do next. First off, thank you. That was very kind. Mm-hmm. And we are friends and we talk a bunch mm-hmm. and you've been super encouraging and that mm-hmm. means a ton to me, but yeah, it, it was okay. very much a compilation. I think the first edition was 44 stories that were written over 10 years. And so it was very much gathering. And some of these things had first lived as blogs or that I I'm thankful for the freedom that I got, I guess, from the publisher in terms of, I mean, there's an email to my mom, there's things that first lived as Instagram captions. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a lot of short pieces and I, I was just thankful to be able to, to gather all of that and, and have it, you know, put in one place to be able to share it. And obviously there's something really special. I, I don't know the numbers, but I, I, I'm aware of how rare it is to, to not only get to do a book, but to have it be well-received to get to yeah. do a book or, you know, to have placement in stores and, and things like yeah. that. So it was a dream come true. I had, it was such a, you know, I had thought about it and wondered and kind of anyone I think who starts to consider themselves a writer is probably curious about that, that dream or that possibility. And you and I have talked, we, I got to do a, like a legitimate book tour. Yeah. And I think close to 20 cities. I got to go to Honolulu. I got to go yeah. to Toronto, you know, so many, I was in New York the first night, LA the next night. And it, it was wonderful. Like it was such a cool thing. I was for the tour. I was either with my sister or my best friend mm-hmm. for the, like they each did half the tour with me. So to not be alone, to get to share the experience you know, this was pre pandemic and it was also right. like the chance to be in, you know, not only Barnes and Noble, but like some of the coolest independent bookstores that I had yeah. never heard of in, in all of these great cities. So it was, it was awesome. And, and I think part of leaving to write love is almost forcing myself to, to do that again, like to lose mm-hmm. the security of being on the payroll and and to lose the excuses of being busy with other things and to say, all right, I'm, I've kind of been a writer who hasn't been writing in recent yeah. years and I'm going to force myself to, to change that. So I, mm-hmm. I want to, I want to do it again. And I, I don't know exactly what that will look like. You know, if you feel too much does represent, I think how I've written in terms of mm-hmm. a write about life and relationships, heartache, friends, mm-hmm. travel, um, mental health and, you know, a lot of short pieces that are maybe on the poetic side. So my hunch is, you know, a lot of that would continue to be true and continue to show up. Uh, But I, I want to keep doing it. I think this is your year to write it. Um, You've tackled 10 years of your life. So it'll be interesting to see what you write from this point in your life at this age and having experienced what you've experienced and um, cause you started, I mean, some of your early writings in that book, you're like, tw- are you 29, 28, maybe? Oh, I'm, no, I mean, I'm even earlier. Cause it was, it basically starts with to write. Oh love. yeah, that's true. So yeah. Like 26, 25, 26. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, you'll probably say things in the way that you still say them, but you have new things to say now. Mm. Um, and so that's exciting. I, I'm excited for you because you're also, what else are you doing right now? Cause you've, you're, you're, you're building out kind of new yeah. career space for yourself. So like, I, I think at the top of the list, it would be writing and speaking. Speaking yeah. is a, to some extent on hold during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. But uh, when you did, like when you were kind of speaking often, what did that look like? It was primarily colleges and universities, mm-hmm. which I, I really loved. I, it, that really felt like a sweet spot. Um, 
I love being around students, being around young people. I know you are because they mm -hmm. sometimes live at your house. They live here. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but then, you know, thankful for opportunities beyond that, you know, every now and then a corporate event. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There, I think as a speaker in my hunches, you can relate, like it feels healthy to say yes to a lot of different invites, especially yeah. mental health feels so important. So, I mean, I literally, it's like, I've done a Ted talk. I've done my second cousin's fifth grade career day, which actually the <laughs> yeah. career day was way scarier than a Ted oh talk. Oh my gosh. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I have spoken, I think I have, but I've spoken like in an arena. It's like 20,000 people. I'm in the middle, like in around totally. 20, the scariest damn thing I have ever done in my entire life was speak to my kids' middle school, like at an yeah. assembly. And it wasn't even the good kind when you're in the theater and they're kind of- It's like in the gym? We were in the gym. And I just, I kind of just had a panic attack. Like I'm looking around, nobody's listening. They it don't was care. the sound bouncing off the- Yeah, that... so it was a disaster. It was just disastrous. Like I was sweating. Like yeah. I go sweaty. Like I just want this to be over. And I just ran out the side totally. door. Anyway, I know what you're saying. So, so well, thank you for you make, know, these letting me issues, make that about me. These, these are issues mm -hmm. that affect people. And it's been really special, you know, whether it's conferences or actually I left this out, but a lot of it early on was music. Like literally I would get oh, yeah. to go on tour with friends, bands. And before they're set, I would go on for sometimes two or three minutes. And that was like, it was such a cool, yeah. healthy challenge people are, I mean, literally I would walk on and people are expecting the band. Yeah. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a letdown and having to try to figure out, you know, how to be heard, how to get their mm -hmm. attention, keep their attention and then, and then say real things. Mm -hmm. And, and so that was honestly a lot of the early days and I'm, you know, I'm, I enjoy it. I, I also enjoy the travel. And, and so I, I look forward, you know, hopefully before too long to get back to doing that consistently. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to ask your opinion about um, mental health is so front and center in the pandemic. Um, you know, so many of our stuff has just risen to the surface. You know, I've had it right here in my own house, uh, my own family, um, depression and anxiety and our social isolation and fear, uh, just such a metric of, um, a, just a myriad of crises. And so, um, what do you think, how would you advise us just ordinary people listening, just the regulars? Um, we're not mental health professionals. We're not counselors. Um, we're just like friends and sisters and moms and daughters and sons. And, um, what's our lift here? What do we do collectively um, to help create a world where depression and anxiety and any really mental health crisis is recognized um, and then treated with compassion as opposed to with judgment or even confusion. Like how can we collectively sort of um, turn the tides on this, especially now? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I think the first thing that always comes to mind is, is just the value of honest relationships, of honest conversations. Like when we truly know someone and when we allow ourselves to be known, that is such a head start in terms of being able to share real things or, or to have people trust us enough to open up about how they're really doing. And, and if, that's, if there's a consistent dialogue where there's vulnerability that's, that goes both ways, I think that's our best chance at at this stuff, not living as secrets and, and not being surrounded by shame, you know? So when I let people really know me, even when I'm struggling, I, I, I think there's just something beautiful that can happen. And it doesn't mean that we have the perfect speech or we have all of the tools or the language, but we get to make sure people feel seen and feel heard. Mm -hmm. And then we can, we can walk alongside them to those resources that they need. So I, I also love to point out just that even during a pandemic that professional help is available, that we can mm -hmm. use technology. I mean, I do counseling every week, sometimes twice a week with my counselor who's in another state through what you and I are doing right now. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, there are phone lines and text lines, um, telehealth. So mm -hmm. we, can, we can take advantage of the technology that exists 
to know that we don't have to wait for the pandemic to end to get mm -hmm. whatever help we might need to have the support that we need and deserve. But I, I just think so much, I mean, even, and you know this, but like I've come through a tough season, like a, mm -hmm. a heartache and a, a really tough couple months. And, and it, you notice the people that show up and the people that don't, you notice the mm -hmm. friends that have language more than others. And it, it's not to like throw certain people under the bus, but I, I just, there's something so powerful about the people that are willing to sit and listen. The people, even, even the days that you would text me and ask how I was doing, like mm -hmm. that alone is so meaningful. And it, it, it's not that you had all of the answers or, you know, but just the people that care that just remind you, Hey, you matter to me. Your life matters to me. Your struggle matters to me. So those are a few things that come to mind. Mm. Um, I don't, I didn't say it at the top of the show, but that is actually how we met is well on the internet. That's where people meet now. And, mm -hmm. but we met on social media cause we were both sad. So I said a sad thing and you're like, Hmm, I, I am sad too. I'm like, Oh, hi. <laughs> hey, well, no, I love the question that you asked me. You, mm -hmm. It was like one of the first yeah. sentences you wrote, you said, what is your suffering? I know. I, well, I like, you were clearly such a cool, suffering. Such a, such a cool question. <laughs> You're like, how much time do you have? Yeah. Like, um, yeah, but like to your point, like to the whole answer that you just gave is a connection point, which is just mm -hmm. honesty. Like, um, I was like, I'm really sad. I'm going to just put that on the whole internet. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then there's something powerful in it. Like totally. it creates, it takes away some shame yeah. and loneliness because it's lonely to be in your own head with no one there with you. Yeah. And then it's a magnet for yeah. people who are looking for someone who's telling the truth and understands how they feel. Um, that's my experience too. So we're talking to Jamie today about mental health. And we also started the episode talking about these seasons of transitions and believing for better things. So maybe you are in a season of transition and that looks like channeling energy into a passion project or a small business that you really want to build and bring to life. And if that's the case, let me give you a little tip. Stamps.com. Um, Stamps.com lets you print official postage right from your computer and saves you money in the process. So you spend less time at the post office and more time making whatever your stuff is. It's just a little shift that can make a huge difference in helping you in the day to day. No matter if you're mailing a bunch of papers and invoices or shipping orders or sending out packages, stamps.com gives you access to hugely discounted rates, like up to 40% off USPS rates and 76% off UPS. And that adds up y'all. And with their rate advisor tool, you can compare shipping rates and timelines to easily find the best option. When your mail or packages are ready, you just schedule a pickup or you can drop them off, but it's easy as that. They've been around for more than 20 years and have been indispensable for more than a million businesses. I use stamps.com in my personal life and my whole team uses it for everything, especially when we ship out care packages and boxes and of course, everything in the Gin Hat Maker Book Club. So stop overpaying for shipping with stamps.com. Sign up with promo code for the love for a special offer that includes a four week trial free postage and a digital scale. And you guys, no long-term commitments or contracts. So just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page and enter the code for the love. You know, this whole series is called for the elephant in the room, for the love of the elephant in the room, because we're talking about hard things. Um, and you've done hard work for 15 years. This is, this, these are hard places that you have stared into. And so in that thread, like, things that are hard to deal with or face or manage or whatever um, from a higher level, not just like dialing into your particular organization, but just in general, how do you, and just tell the truth. Um, how do you personally tend to approach really uncomfortable conversations? I know a little bit about this. I'm going to be curious to see what you say, but uncomfortable conversations are hard or even confrontational. Like, are you an avoider? Do you, mm. are you, do you come to the table? I'm just, there's so many yeah. ways to handle it. 
It depends. Um, probably a bit of both, you know, mm -hmm. and you and I are close enough that I, I know I've shared some of those moments. So I think it depends on the day. I, I mean, I feel like to some extent, we all get to choose our battles. We all get to choose if and when we talk about these hard things. Uh -huh. And obviously hard things is a broad category, you yeah. know. Um, I think I'm trying to learn how to show up in love. And and I feel like I'm erring on the side of conflict, but, but maybe it's true for all conversations like to not lead or to, that when the person walks away at the end, they don't feel like I just wanted to be right mm. or I wanted to prove my point um, or I had a way to fix them or change them, but that in the mix or in the midst of that, they felt like I cared for them. I cared about mm -hmm. them. And I think that applies to politics. I think that applies to yeah. mental health. So I, I, and I, yeah, I mean, like even, even on the political note for a moment, the Trump, the early Trump years were really hard for me and hard for a lot of people. And there was a lot of anger. And my sister made a comment that really stuck with me. She said, basically, I don't want you to bully the bullies. She mm -hmm. felt I was doing quote tweets and, yeah, you know, blasting people who were blasting me. And, and that really stayed with me was like, how do we have hard conversations with kindness? Like as yeah. cliche as that sounds, you know, and, and I, that applies to private conversations mm -hmm. about, you know, the vaccination. Mm -hmm. um, it applies to, hey, I'm, I, I feel like you're struggling. Could, would mm -hmm. you be open to sharing or are you, could we help you find some help? You know, I, mm -hmm. but I, I do want to err on the side of being willing to have those conversations. I, I mm -hmm. think just trying to do it in a way that is compassionate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're good at that. Um, I tend to want to avoid. And so I'm always trying to learn about what it looks like to confront, but in a way that's healthy and has dignity in it. And it's, it's a connecting point, not just a disconnection point, which mm -hmm. is, I always equate confrontation with disconnection. And that's not necessarily true. Mm. Um, it doesn't have to be true. And so anyway, that's why we go to therapy. Yeah. And I, I don't know, one thing that comes to mind, it's like, if I think about my life, the people I know, people I communicate with, like ongoing conversations, I have people close to me who are struggling, who have been struggling for months. There are people who I are my friends who I disagree with politically. And those, those circumstances haven't been changing. So it's like, I want to keep showing up for these friendships. And obviously I'm closer to some people than others, but like, I want to keep caring for these people. And I, I, I want to, in a way that's healthy and balanced and not overwhelming, like be willing to have those conversations, you know? And, and I, I keep saying this, but like with the caveat that we can do that in a way that's respectful, in a way that's kind. It's a fresh new idea because it's certainly not the what we see out there. It's well, just like, like here's here's a tiny. I thought of this. I woke up. I don't even. I don't think I told you this story. I woke up to a DM from a friend a couple of days ago, and he basically just said I, I had posted a, a graph from the New York Times about okay. hospitalization rates, yeah. and he was like, "Can you please stop? You've been doing this for two years. Mm. I'm sick of seeing it. Can you stop?" And mm. I called him. And it, the first few minutes were really hard. Yeah. We were both pretty much angry. We didn't agree. And then we, I was able to share, like, long story short, I, we had this great conversation and I honestly mm. feel closer to him. And yeah. this is a friend for 25 years. Oh, yeah. So like, we were able to tap back into something and because we addressed this elephant, yeah, like, we both came away where it wasn't, it ended up not being a conversation about vaccines. Like it ended mm. up being a conversation about our friendship and what does it look like to disagree, but to love each other. And I mean, I, I, I challenged him. Like I said, Hey, I've, I've, I've gone through a really hard season and I only hear from you when you disagree. Mm. And he wow. was like, man, you're right. I want to, I want to do better. Like I want to mm. be a better friend. And that was, it, so it was cool. There's, I feel like there are these moments where we're reminded that it's worth it, mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. it is possible for these things to go well. And, and certainly they don't always go well or, or they, it may take months or years, but like it's worth it to have these hard conversations. That's a great example. 
Um, okay. Now this is a question that everybody gets at the end of the show and you're prepared for it or you're supposed to be prepared for it. I told you. Um, and so you can, you know, you can answer this however you want. It can, you can be like nice and sweet, mm-hmm. or you can mm-hmm. just be absurd mm-hmm. and you have both gears. So, um, okay. You know, I got this question from Barbara Brown Taylor. And so she asks what's saving your life right now. I have a, a little dog named Gracie yeah. who you've met mm-hmm. and she currently is at grandma's house because she was barking mm-hmm. too much and your podcast is a big deal, mm-hmm. but Gracie is a lifesaver every day. My little buddy, my little companion, but I think that's part of my answer, but I, you know, I, the last couple of months have been really hard, really sad. And I feel like just in the last couple of weeks or even in the last week, like, there's a sense of hope. There's a sense of healing. Maybe some of it's tied to the new year, but there's just, rather than missing this person who's no longer in my life, I was somehow able to shift to like the possibility of new life, of doing work that feels purposeful, of kind of just this blank slate or this Mm -hmm. blank canvas. And in a way that's somehow genuine, like beyond what I can explain, like feeling like I might be healing yeah, and feeling like life is still worth living and I get to keep going, who knows for how long, but I, every day, you know, I I get to have all these experiences and and I want to stay for the surprises. So I don't know, I guess healing is saving my life. Um, Mm -hmm. It's funny, I, I threw out and I feel like you, maybe tried to ask about this earlier, but I, I've had a really lazy, unmotivated, strange, sad, really last year. Yeah. And I just wanted to change that. I like wanted to get off the couch and do something Mm. that I believed in that felt meaningful. And I've thought about offering coaching or consulting Mm. and I've, I've thought about it, but been too scared to put it out there. And, and I, and then Friday or as we're talking a few mm-hmm. days ago, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put this out there and literally just posted it on Instagram and yeah. wrote a long caption and left an email address and, and got this incredible response. Yeah. And I, and there's like a long disclaimer. I'm not a therapist. I have no training as a coach. I, I simply have my experience. So it, almost trying to talk people out of hiring sure. me, but then if they want to, but like I had my first appointment uh-huh. last night and there's been all of this interest. And I think it, it sort of reminded me that people believe in me. It reminded yeah. me that I, I have life that I want to share. I have experience that I want to share. And, and so I think that that bit of new life is saving me as well. I love it. Um, and you know how I feel about this. I feel like sometimes you put like, some energy behind something new with like a lot of possibility baked into it. And all of a sudden possibility is everywhere. Like Mm. the writer's block like unravels and like the, the fog lifts over here, like relationally. And Mm. I just think that, you know, that rising tide kind of lifts every boat in the Harbor. And so it's great. I love this for you. So Let's just tell everybody really quickly where they can like find you. Where can they find your book? Where can they, if they need a coach, and by the way, can you just like briefly run the gamut of the types of things that you feel excited about coaching someone through or a group yeah. of people really? <laughs> totally. So my experience is nonprofit, mental health, branding, uh, transition. I feel like I've quit my dream job twice, once yeah. with Hurley, once with to write love on her arms. Right. Um, so I feel like if someone's really struggling with their mental health, they deserve a therapist. They deserve a licensed counselor. And so I am not that, but I'm comfortable talking about mental health. I'm definitely comfortable talking about the ways some of these things intersect. Maybe they're dreaming about a career change, dreaming about starting a nonprofit or seeing that charity or brand grow. Um, those are those are some of the kind of mm-hmm. sweet spots for me. But I think being in a transition, I, I really get excited about talking to people who either are thinking about one or, or maybe they're in one. And certainly that applies to all of us at different points, but, but those are, those are a few examples. And it's been mm-hmm. really cool. Even 
in just reading the emails, like just being introduced to people's stories, parts of people's stories. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited about it. But uh, my website is just my name. It's jamietworkowski.com. Social media is the same, Instagram, Twitter. Um, my book is on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all the places. There's, there are links on the website. Again, it's if you feel too much. So I'm easy to find. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it so much. Thank, I do want to say this. If, are we still going? Yeah. Um, you've, you have been such an encouragement to me in the last couple months, and I am so grateful for that. So thank you for being in my life. You're welcome. Um, okay, you guys, you go follow Jamie everywhere he's at and buy his book and hire him as your coach. And maybe you'll get a Gracie sighting. It's mm-hmm. possible. Mm-hmm. It is really, really possible. It's- she's really cute. She's, she was uh-huh. just being a bad girl today. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm sorry. She didn't get to be in, the, in your house, but her return is imminent. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye. All right, you guys. Great. Right. He's great. That conversation is great. Um, so much in there. Um, and we barely scratched the surface. And so I cannot recommend enough, like go to Jamie's things, like go to his socials, go to his website, um, pick up his book. Like it's, there's so much more here, but, um, definitely dial into the, um, resources and we'll link to all of this, you guys over at jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, we'll have this episode. We'll have all the show notes, but most importantly, we'll have all these links in one place for you, not just to Jamie and his work and his social stuff, but also to write love. Um, so that if this is something that you need right now, or somebody that you love needs, um, you can find it, find all the resources in one spot there. And so you'll be really, really glad you did. And, um, I just want you to know those of you listening who are in a place of like mental health crisis, that you are so deeply loved and you are not alone. Um, and there's so much hope still, and that we are pulling for you and we are cheering for you and you are wanted and you are needed. And, um, and there's life and light possible. And so, um, I hope that you choose to invest in yourself, in your own recovery, in your own healing, um, And this is one place to get started on it. So you guys more to come in the elephant in the room series. We are, we are tackling some tough stuff. I'll just tell you that right now. Like, um, the whole series is so powerful, but every single time I'm preparing for one of the interviews, I'm like, this is some heavy lifting. Um, and we're happy to do it for you. And we're happy to pull all these challenging conversations into one series for you. And really, as always, just hope it serves you well. And so, um, Laura and her podcast team and Amanda and I are just so happy to be in a new year with you and bringing you a whole new year of incredible guests and topics and series. And this podcast just makes us so happy and we love working on it and we love you. And, um, thanks for being so loyal year after year after year. You're literally the best. All right, you guys see you next week. Bye.